Let's see if we can't put an end to this strike first, huh? Mrs. Krabappel, why don't you begin? Boo! Oh, boo yourself. Our demands are simple. A small cost of living increase and some better equipment and supplies for your children. Oh, that's oh, right. Give it to them! Yeah, in the dream world, we have a very tight budget to do what she's asking. We'd have to raise taxes. Raise taxes! Oh, right. 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 It's your children's future. Oh, the children's children are important. Yes. It'll cost you. Give it taxes! Right. 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 Come on! All right, that's a good point. Yes. Oh, oh, not man, the taxes. That, 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 the finger thing means the taxes. Well, I guess this is a case where we'll have to agree to disagree. I don't agree to that. Neither do I. Oh, this is a deli of a pickle. There's a lot of teachers that teach that you will go through the tribulation. Well, be my guest. I can tell you one thing. Those ho this whole debate over. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, it's just like going to a restaurant and how do you want your steak? Rare, medium, well, well done? How do you want to get to heaven? Rare, medium, well, or well done? All I know is one thing. If we need to spend time in front of the Bema seat of Jesus, and if we need to stay and have the marriage ceremony up there, and if we want to look at those mansions that he's been faithfully working on for the last 2,000 years, we're not described as going with crutches and on wheelchairs because we made it through halfway of the tribulation or completely dead without heads because we are at the end of the tribulation. No, that's not the case. We're standing there. The only thing that has to happen to all of us prior to us going to be with Him is that all of those lowly bodies, sorry for my compliment this morning, all of our lowly bodies will have to change. That's it. Turn to 1 Thessalonians in the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now I'll begin reading in verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. I believe tonight in the evening service, I'm going to draw you a picture on, I believe, on things God can give you, things God can give you. Folks are looking for a handout these days, and something from the government, you know. I'm talking about some things God can give you tonight that nobody else can give you, and draw you a picture in uh, colored chalk on that subject, things God can give you, as far as I know right now. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning at verse 9. Now, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture for a Christian and deal with the second advent. And I want to talk this morning on what to do if you miss the rapture. What to do if you miss the rapture. <laughs> All right, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that you study to be quiet and do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that ye may walk, walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Two reasons why the Christian should work. Three, he was commanded to, and secondly, so he have what he needs, and thirdly, so unsafe people won't always be after him for bills and notes. Thirteen, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Uh, Christian death is always spoken of as sleeping, not, not death. Uh, the body is dead. Bodies down there on the ground, but the Christian is just asleep in Christ. For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, that's the body that's dead, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You see, no Bible-believing Christian believes the world is coming to an end. Now, these unsaved people, they often slander us and misrepresent us. And they paint us as somebody prating up downtown with a sign on a stick saying, Repent, the world is coming to an end. We don't believe that. There's no Bible-believing Christian ever lived to believe the world was coming to an end. We know there's a rapture, a judgment seat of Christ, an advent, and a reign a thousand years before this world is done with. We don't buy that stuff. 
the world's coming. I'm not worried about the world coming to an end. The scientists are worrying about it. <laughs> not us. We're not worrying about it. You know, a man said years ago, the preacher said the world was coming to an end, and the scientists laughed at him, and now the scientists say the world is coming to an end, and the preachers are laughing at him. <laughs> a lot of truth in that, you know. Scientists said the world is coming to an end. I'm not worried about it. Because so the atom bomb going to blow us to smithereens. It ain't about to. It ain't about to. It might blow Pensacola off the map. But what's Pensacola? <laughs> Eighteen. Now, if you're settled down in the world, you, you might resent that, see, but if you're... Citizenship is in heaven. What do you care whether it blows Pensacola off the map or not? Just good as any other place. Would you rather get blown off here or blown off Boston? Eighteen. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. <laughs> That's a great homiletical outline there, brother. Now, let me tell you something. The Bible teaches one of these days, one of these nights, the Lord is going to come. And when he comes in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, hundreds and thousands of people all over this earth are going to leave. He doesn't teach the world's coming to an end. He teaches what we call the rapture. Now, the word rapture is not in the Bible as such. But here's a description that says when the Lord comes, he's going to catch out those that are dead in Christ, those that sleep in Christ, and those of us that are alive and remain. In plain words, one of these days, regardless of your political outlook and your social outlook and your denominational conceit, one of these days, God's going to reach down this earth and he's going to show you divine segregation and divine discrimination in no uncertain terms and you ain't going to forget it. The Lord's going to prove that he's selective. I don't know what you've been reading, the crowd you've been hanging out with. I could care less and the Lord could care less than that. Someday the Lord's going to reach down this earth and deliberately, maliciously, with prejudice aforethought, discriminate and segregate his people from this world. That's what's going to happen. And it's going to be just like it was down there in, the, in Egypt. When the Lord reached down there and said, I'm going to put darkness down here, and those Hamites from Egypt are going to see darkness in their dwellings, and over here they're going to be light. Now, you know what to call that? You call that discrimination. And the only way you can get rid of that is get rid of your Bible. So this nation right now is engaged in getting rid of this word. And while they're getting rid of this word, they're singing, Glory, glory, hallelujah, his truth is marching on. What is? All right, someday God's going to do it. Did you ever see the advertisement that say, Don't miss it. Don't miss it. You know, the Super Bowl. Don't miss it. Next week's show. Don't miss it. Miss this. Don't miss this star-studded extravaganza, you know. Now in living color, you know. Living sin in living color. Cinemascope with 40,000 kilowatt stereophonic tweeter woofer double kaleidoscope yellow list. Don't miss it. Let me tell you something. The thing you don't want to miss is the rapture. That's what you better have missed. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. They say the new car is coming out next week. Don't miss them. They say the Dodger is going to... Play the whatever they're going to play. Monkeys, bats, vultures, whatever they are. Don't miss it, you know. Don't miss it. Don't miss the rapture. Now, if you do, if you do, I'm going to give you some good advice. Now, maybe there's somebody here in this building this morning going to miss the rapture. I hope not. But it might be. For example, if the Lord came right this minute, voice the archangel, come to God, out you go, out you go. There might be somebody sitting here, and somebody sitting here, a couple of them sitting here, most of them back in there, <laughs> sitting there. <laughs> And if the Lord came in right now, you know, and up you go, then what would you... I mean, that's just... You know, when I preach, uh, I people sit down close to me, they never have to worry about anything. I'll hardly even look down here. I always shoot right back in there, right back in there. And I myself, no, now, don't get upset. Some of you get some nervous on <laughs> Not to have a heart attack. I ain't even got warmed up yet. I'm not, I'm not saying because you're sitting back there, you're going to hell. I'm not saying that. Maybe the sound better back there. What, what, what a nation, man. What a nation. I going to say, oh, if, if the Lord had come right now and they get out of all this building and some of you left, then what are you going to do? All right, I'm going to tell you three things you better do if you miss it. And you may miss it. I mean, the Lord may come and call and you may find yourself just sitting there looking at the pulpit. Or it may come this afternoon, have your family leave at the dinner table, leave you sitting there looking at the chicken, the turkey, whatever it is. And you might be at a ball game someday and the Lord come and uh, half a dozen of them leave there, you know, and you still got a good bit of company sitting there. But if you get left, 
If you miss the rapture, I'm going to tell you three things you ought to do. All right, first of all, don't get excited. <laughs> don't get excited, you're going to hell anyway. I'm just amazed how somebody gets so excited and upset after it's all over. Listen, you were headed for hell anyway, what you getting excited about? It's no time to get excited then, get excited now. See? Well, so the Lord comes out the door and the guy says, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you ought to be saying that now. Not after the leave. Don't get excited. You're going to hell anyway. And listen, you've never been excited, even though you've been warned. You've had preachers all over the South tell you you're going to burn, you're going to burn, you're going to burn, you're going to burn. You've had fanatics down here in the street saying you must be born again, you must be born again. You've heard over radio, you've seen it over television, one time at a coon's age, and you've got it in gospel tracts, and you've read it in magazines once in a while. You've been warned what you get nervous about. If you miss it, don't get excited. You're going to burn anyway. What's the difference? If you didn't make it or didn't make it, you're going to hell. You're going to hell if the Lord leaves you here when he comes. When he comes, he's coming for saved people, not for lost people. Don't get the sweat. Be lost anyway. You're like a little boy went back to his mom in the train and he said, what was the name of that last town? She said, I don't know. Don't bother me. About ten minutes later, he said, Mom, what was the name of that last town we went through back there? She said, I don't know. Don't bother me. And about ten minutes later, he said, Mama, what's the name of that last town? And she said, I don't know why you keep asking. And she said, because my brother just got off there. <laughs> well, it's too late. It's too late. Some folks are like that. You've been warned. You've had plenty of chance to get warned. You're like a lady one time was going down a one-way street the wrong way, and a cop chased her down there about four or five blocks and put on the sign, finally got over the side. And when he got over the side, he said, lady, didn't you hear me hollering at you all the way down that street? And she said, oh, yeah, I heard that, but I just thought that was somebody I'd banged into. <laughs> Uh, if the Lord comes and you're left, there's no need to get upset. You might just well ignore it. You lost the story. You ain't going nowhere to start with. Except hell. You tell folks out that don't believe it. You will when the rapture comes and they get all out and you leave. I'll tell you something else. You shouldn't get excited because it'll be useless anyway. You can't go up after we go up. When the Lord comes and calls out the Christians and you're left down here, you can sweat and pray and cry and holler and scream and curse. It won't make any difference. You might as well get your dander up. You're not going anywhere. It's useless. The thing's already done. It's already over. If you like a case where a stewardess said to her mother one time, you know, playing, she said, I'm missing two passengers. Are they your children? And she said, well, I don't know. Around here somewhere. And she said, I've searched over the plane. I can't find them. And the mother said, well, they were just causing out a racket. I told them to go outside and play. You know, like, you, like, you know, that didn't happen, you know. But I mean, that's the illustration of it, you know. If they open the door and stepped outside to play, you're not going to suddenly get excited and haul them back up in the, in the plane. I'll tell you something that did happen out in the town out west, back about 1890. Oh, cowboy came there in those old small towns, got him a small hotel, went upstairs, and got him a room. And he was up there about 30 minutes, and he came back down. And he said, I want to check out. That is double bag with him. And they said, is the room all right? He said, it's all right, except it's on fire. <laughs> and you know some people like that? You know, a guy goes, well, time to check out now. Room's on fire. Anything wrong with your room? No, it's okay. It's just burning, going out the door. And, you know, I'm talking to somebody here right now, and that's your attitude about the gospel anyway, isn't it? I mean, uh, you're going to hell, you're going to burn well. You know, that's what they say. I've heard that before. Uh, it may, may not be true. Don't get excited. Won't do you any good. It's useless. Once the door shut, they came around and knocked and said, open on us. And he said, I don't know where you're from. I don't know where you're from. It's useless. Number two, start working your way to heaven. If the Lord comes and takes us home this afternoon and you're left, start working, boy. I mean, you always did believe it anyway, didn't you? Didn't you think you could? Uh, am I not talking right now to a dozen people that said you got to live it? Am I not talking probably over this radio here this morning to hundreds and thousands of people in Pensacola said, I don't believe you got to live it. Well, bud, you better start living it. Oh, you go to hell like a torch. Let me tell you something. The day of grace is over when we go up. And when we go up, that book says, Here are those who have the faith of Jesus Christ and the commandments of God. He that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. We're made partakers if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast unto the end. There's an element of works in the tribulation, brother. And when this church age ends and the body of Christ goes out, you better get ready to work. And if you haven't been used to working for salvation, you better start working at it, because you're going to have to work. You're going to have to keep the commandments. We used to have an art exhibit down here in the streets on the, you know, shore pictures down there at a certain time of year. 
We put them all along the streets. And I had more time back in those days. And I'd take my drawings down there and my paintings and sit down on the street. And I'd get me an old uh, black T-shirt, you know, and a pair of tennis shoes. And I wouldn't wear a beret, but I'd get some kind of a hat with a cap on it, you know, kind of disguised. And I'd go down there and sit down with those pictures and then just listen to the comments. I wish I had a tape recorder. I wish I had a tape recorder. I'd give them some nice landscapes, you know, and a couple of portraits and things. And then I'd kind of smuggle in some of those pictures like you see here on Sunday night, put them across there. And they'd go by there. I, I'll never forget one time went by there and they had a little boy about eight years old. And he looked at that picture and he said, Mama, he said, they're throwing that man to hell. <laughs> and the mother said, here we go, here we go. I said, but Mama, the, 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 the phone, the, never mind, never mind. Come on, look at this pretty picture over here, honey. But Mama, they're burning, and the lands are burning, and they throw them in. <laughs> oh, boy, you know. And one of those kids went by there about eight or nine years old, and he said, look at that. The devil's got that man. The devil. The father said, never mind. <laughs> and a, uh, out there was one, one coop that came down there. Boy, he was a coop from Coopsville. And that fellow came down there, had on this kind of a plaid jacket, you know, and, and uh, underwear. Bermuda shorts looked like underwear to me. And, uh, and plaid stockings and some dizzy looking purple shoes and a cane and a monocle, you know, and a beret. I mean, real, real square. <laughs> and that guy came by there and he... And then he came over and he said, are you the artist? I said, yeah, I'm an artist. He said, thank you so much for sharing that with us. <laughs> See, way out, way out. And a couple of ensigns came by there, a couple of those ensigns, look, look at that thing, and one said, look at this, man, look at this, this fella sure got a blankety cuss, you know. He said, this fella sure got a blankety blank sense of humor, you know. What the blankety blank drew this blankety blank thing? And I, they talked around the while, I said, uh, I painted him. And I got told those fellas, I said, you fellas save. And they both straightened up with their military bearing, and they said, yes, yes, we believe in keeping the golden rule. We keep the golden rule. Fella stand there cussing like a Navy man, which he was. <laughs> stand there black. I've been keeping the golden rule. You do, huh? You do, huh? You know, some of us don't particularly care to hear you cussing. Do others you'd have to do under you? I appreciate people cussing around me. I'll tell you something. If the Lord comes and you're left here, you better keep all ten the golden rule and some more, too. Because in the tribulation, it's endurance. It's by works. Why, that shouldn't be too hard for some of you. I hear you talk about it all the time. There isn't anybody in this building has done personal work in this town and heard him sit in the chair and say, I believe you ought to live it. Yes, sir, I believe you ought to live it. Well, you better live it then, friend. You'll have your chance. I heard him on the radio this morning. I listened to three or four of them every morning before I come to the church, you know, to kind of get stirred up, you know, and get, get my uh, boiler stoked up. And those fellas, I heard one this morning coming down there, you know. And I want to tell you, fellow, I'm Jesus, I'm enjoying my salvation, yes, sir, and I'm hoping I'm going to make it to heaven, I'm doing my best, and I think I'm going to make it, because I hope, I hope, I hope, that it work, 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 work. The Lord comes and leaves you here. Better keep all ten commandments, better hadn't bust one of them. He said, here, those have the faith of Jesus Christ and keep the commandments of God, you better keep the Sabbath. You better find you a church that worships on Saturday. That's right, brother. You better keep all ten of them if you're left. One time they said, said a little girl in Sunday school, they said, what is this, what's this commandment for mothers and fathers, you know? And they, they had it right. She said, honor thy father and thy mother. And the teacher said, what's the commandment for dealing with brothers and sisters? And she said, thou shalt not kill. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, if the Lord comes, you've got to keep all ten of them and then some, and he shall do at the end the same shall be saved. You better keep them all. After all, you always despise us people that believe in grace, didn't you? Didn't you? Honestly. Honestly, when some of you go home and sit around the table, don't you talk about these hypocrites in the church, you know? Talk about being the saved of grace and don't live it, don't practice what they preach. Yes, you old god defined rebel. Let me tell you something. When the Lord comes and leaves you here, you'll have a chance to show us how to live. Now, we'll look down from heaven and watch your big old self-righteous work, see you putting on the dog. That old book says in that tribulation, he that shall go to the end, the same shall be saved. You'll have to live it for seven years. Seven years. Boy, you count me out, I'm leaving. I ain't going to live for seven years. I'm going to count the grace of God to get me out. It's going to be, it's going to be a marathon. There was a preacher one time named Engels in Baltimore, Maryland, and he had a tent meeting outside of Baltimore. And one night when he left his motel, he couldn't find where the tent was. He got lost in downtown Baltimore. And he stopped the newsboy and said, did you tell me how to get to such and such a street? And the kid told him. 
And then the man witnessed to him, Engels did, and said, now I want to tell you how to get to heaven. And that kid said, if you don't know how to get to such and such a street, how in the world can you tell me how to get to heaven? You know, I mean, turn up her nose out, that kind of thing. And some of you folks that believe in living it, talking about living it, that's exactly how you feel about us. We tell you how to get to heaven, you've got to feel like, well, if you can't do as good as I do and live like I live, live like I live, how can you tell me how to get to heaven? Well, I can tell you. And you better listen. If you don't listen, you better get ready, you better get ready to live it. And you better live for seven years. Boy, you better have to make one mistake. You better be an all-time endurance record. I picked up the other day what I consider to be perhaps the greatest record of endurance I ever read of in my life, just for an example here. But you know, the Guinness Book of Records has all these endurance tests in it, you know, marathon, dancing, you know, and all this, how long they last. I picked up one here. This is a guy, his name is Heinz Arndt, and he played in the cafeteria in Dusseldorf. He's a piano player, and he played a piano for 423 hours, which come to 17 days and 15 hours without stopping. Playing in a Dusseldorf orchestra known as an utterly powerless performer, the German was persuaded to take on Jack Vanderbilt, the American marathon piano playing champion, who had come to Berlin to meet all challengers. The match in the cafe turned out to be a no-contest affair. Vanderbilt, all tuckered, out, all tuckered out, had to quit after 72 hours. Arnst, who hadn't even raised a sweat, played on another three hours just to stay in shape before arrived to take a bow as a new champion and then sat down and went on for another 50 hours. Uh, he had a high record of 108 hours before the Berlin stretch. The last time anybody was silly enough to challenge him was in 1960 when he took on Roger Rabot in France. Uh, Rabot staggered from the Keys after 240 hours. Arnst paid by the clock. Presumably kept on going another 566 hours. In 1965, 66 years old, but showing no signs of wear at all, he ran off a thousand hour performance on his native soil and then beat that record by torching the keys for 1,003 hours, 41 straight days in Paris. Arts five feet four and a trim 130 pounds, later started playing in the Dusseldorf cafeteria, kept playing on the Olivon, the truck bearing him to Bremenhaven, and he got on a ship, played in the baby grand on the ship, or the ship's lounge all the way across, switched to a traveling spinet after he wore the baby grand out, when another truck hauled him to Westbury, then he settled down at the fair, and then he played at the fair another 800 hours. When Herr Arndt called it quits on October 4th, he closed it with a rendition of his favorite march, Alta Kameraden. He had been going for 1,054 hours, just under 44 days since he started. That old boy sat down and played that table, that piano, for 44 days, man. Forty-four days going like that. Just beat that thing to death. And you know something? That thing would be easy alongside what some of you folks are going to have to do that are left here after Jesus Christ comes. You know what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to keep all ten of those things of that golden rule, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, for seven years. This world isn't coming to an end. You've got plenty of time to show us how to live it. And angels and devil be watching. I tell you something else. If you keep the first commandment to love God with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, it's going to cost you your life. It's going to cost you your life. I don't know whether I love the Lord enough right now to die for Him. I mean, standing here in an air-conditioned church with a suit of clothes on, I can say it. But I mean, maybe if I've been lying around a cell three or four months starving to death and getting tortured, maybe I'd change my mind. Well, I'll tell you something, brother. If a saved man that loves God and believes this book is going to be shaking a thing like that, what you going to do that have no use for the Bible, no use for the church, and no use for God's people, and no use for the blood? You think you're going to lay down your life? Not you. Not you. But you're going to have to. In the tribulation, you will. All right, number three. First of all, don't get excited. Number two, you better start living it. Number three... Don't take any mark on your forehead or on your right hand. I saw a picture the other day, and they're taking down a road sign someplace up in Georgia, and they're taking down this big sign that says, Don't take the mark of the beast, 666. When they took that down, they put up a sign over here in Cordova Mall that said, Come see the mark of the devil. Strange world, ain't it? You put the Bible up there, down it comes. You put the devil up there, she stays in the arcade. Strange world, isn't it? Now listen, I'll tell you something. I'm giving you good advice, brother. If the Lord comes and we leave, you better look out for a mark here or a mark there. Are you listening to me? You say, preacher, you're crazy. You'll see. You'll see. I've got a photograph of eyes now going to that Hindu temple with an old spot right between his eyes. 
And for I would say, we used to go to church where they put the ashes in your hand, and we take our finger and dip it in the ashes and put a black spot right between our eyes. You better have them do that after the Lord comes. When the Lord leaves, you better look out for that spot between your eyes in your hand. You better look out for taking a number. You got a house number, you got a telephone number, you got a zip code number, you got a social security number, you got a bank account number, you got an auto plate license number, you got a registration number. When the Lord catches the Christians out, you better look out for any number. You got six in it. Do you ever look at that number in the back of the Naval Air Station? How many of you ever seen it? Let me see your hand. You folks live in Pensacola not too observant, are you? You better have to take any number. You better have to take any mark. And last of all, you better get to be a fanatic. And you know something that's going to be very hard for some of you folks? Because some of you folks, you never have been fanatical about anything. And I'll tell you, when the Lord comes and we leave, you're going to have to be a fanatic for the sake of Jesus Christ and die as a martyr, or you're going to lose your soul. Now, you know something? You don't have to now. It's easy now. Any fool can get saved. Uh, get to saved right now is just easy as just taking a step. God got it fixed so a man is saved by grace through faith plus nothing. Anybody I'm talking to be saved just like that. But I'll tell you, brother, one second after that trumpet sounds, one second after we leave, you're going to be in a spot. You're going to be in a spot. It's going to cost you your life to get to heaven. That's what that Bible says, be thou faithful to death. That's what that Bible says, be faithful unto death, brother. That tribulation passed is talking about you being faithful. They cut off your head. Now, how in the world are some of you folks going to be fanatics? Man, it's going to be hard for some. You never got excited about anything, some of you, except the ball game. And some of you folks have passed that stage now. They didn't even turn you on anymore like it used to. A fellow said a fanatic is a man who, when he's lost sight of his objective, redoubles his effort. <laughs> and America has produced all kinds of fanatics. Uh, one of the most notable assembly of fanatics that ever assembled was up there in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin. I can't remember the place. When the Green Bay Packers paid the plop ploop doodler, some... Some big winner. They had some big winner game up there. It was below zero. And thousands of people sat in that stand four to six hours to watch that thing. Fanatics, man. Fanatics. Fanatic. 1939, a uh, Harvard University student swallowed a four-inch goldfish on a $10 bet. His name was Luthrop Withington. And he started a chain of goldfish swallowers that went over every university in the country. A man named Clark. Swallowed 24 goldfish for $50. A man named Holler Andersky said he could beat him. He swallowed 25 live goldfish. Pennsylvania University education, wonderful thing. A man from Michigan University swallowed 28 goldfish. A man from Boston College then made it 29. And finally, a student at Middlesex University made the world's record of swallowing live goldfish at 67. Fanatics, man. Fanatics. Boy, you got to be a coot to go around swallowing live goldfish. You know, the next thing that swept across this country among the colleges was telephone tie-ups. These uh, educated young Americans decided to see who could set a world record for tying up a telephone booth. And one girl tied it up for six days. Talked on a telephone six days, man. Five nights and six days. <laughs> then a bunch of them said, we got to set a world record for playing bridge. And four of them got, got together, and the world record for one continual hand the bridge was played in 1960 at Cambridge University, and they played bridge for 73 hours. And one old boy got down the table and said, at the end of 73 hours, said, I was having hallucinations. He said, I was seeing cards floating around the room, over my head and back of my head and in front of my face. And he said, I was calling a different hand than what I had in my hand. 73 hours. Fanatics. Fanatics. Some of you wouldn't think of doing a thing like that, but you better learn. You better learn. You better learn. The next craze one across this country was packing phone booths. They put 15 in a telephone booth at Cambridge and uh, at Hatfield University in 1959. They established the world record for stuffing telephone booths. 19 in a telephone booth. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? You know, when Haydn finished conducting his, one of his oratorios, the creation, they all got applauding him and he held his hand and made them stop and he said, applaud God. Let me hear you applaud God. He was doing it long before Cole and Branham and Reverend Ike ever thought of it. Hyden was doing back that in 1870, 1860. Applaud God. Applaud God. Any of you folks ever applaud God and applaud Jesus Christ? Kind of fanatical, isn't it? You guys kind of crazy, you know, going around. Praise God! Praise the Lord! Praise God! 
Try to crack by kind of wholeness of it. Don't it kind of make you nervous? Haven't you clapped at a graduation? Haven't you clapped after a band number? Oh, it's going to be hard. You know what you better do? You better get saved and go up in the rapture. Let me tell you something, bud. You haven't got the metal to make it. Now, you mark my words. You're too conservative. You'd never make it. Just take some good advice, man. Get saved now and go up. You haven't got what it takes. Believe me, you haven't got it. You never have got it, and you never will get it either. You better get grace and go up before it takes place. Up there, I was telling them the other night in Bible class about a preacher up in Spartanburg. We had a, we had a real good place to preach in the street. And when we came there one time, we saw a whole mob of people had our way blocked. We couldn't get in. And there were four, uh, <laughs> there were four Afro-Americans in there. Uh, well, they had a washboard and thimbles, you know, and a, a cowbell and a tin horn, and they were playing the washboard, you know, and one of them blowing something and playing an accordion and, and dancing for pennies. And they had a big crowd. Had about 200 people packed in there. We couldn't get in. And we stopped by the car, and we prayed and said, Lord, break that thing up, break that thing up. We got a good place to preach here, and they got the place blocked. Lord, open the door. And about the time we began to pray, we heard a scream, and we looked up from our prayer, and a big old bony hand shot up in the middle of that crowd. They go, oh, those old skinny old hands, you know, just look like a, a piece of rusty metal sticking up there with claws on it. And that hand was, whoa, going around the air like this. We heard this boy saying, Ah, you bunch of bare-legged women and whiskey drinking stumps! Y'all go to hell! And boy, I'm telling you, that crowd began to move out. You never saw it. Looked like a covey of quail hidden for the swamp, boy. This thing's just going like this. They were stumbling and falling over each other trying to get out of there. I mean, literally dropping on each other. And they had Navy people there and Marine people and uh, fellows in the Army and students and businessmen and farmers. Everybody just breaking the neck to get out of there. And in the middle of that crowd, after a while, we could see this bird. And it was an old skinny North Carolina hillbilly with one gallus on and blue denim pants and a striped shirt. An old redneck, and that guy was going down in the middle of that crowd like this, just going in a circle, and he'd make a wide circle each time, <laughs> and they just scatter, shaking that hand. He's fanatic. That fellow's crazy. <laughs> now, you know something? When the Lord comes and you're left, you're going to have to be a fanatic for Jesus Christ to survive. And believe me, sir, you haven't got it in you. I watched some of, of you for years. You never make it. You haven't got what it takes. You can't make a fool out of yourself for Christ's sake. You just haven't got it. I'll tell you something else I've heard them talking about these folks that do there being stupid, you know. We'll see who's stupid. That book says he that win a soul is wise. We'll get the judgment seat of Christ. We'll see who was smart and who wasn't. You're indifferent about it. And I'll tell you something else. You've been different all your life about some things. And when the Lord comes and takes us out, you better start waking up and getting an earnest man because you're going to have it. I think about Nicholas II. I, when, I, when I think of a man just being indifferent to warning and being indifferent to judgment like some of you are and just not caring, I always think of Tsar Nicholas II. That's the fellow I have the revolution with. And Nicholas II was playing tennis the day his navy was sunk. I mean, the Japanese hit the Russian Navy there, and that Russo-Japanese war, they sank the Russian Navy back in 1904 and 1905. And Tsar Nicholas was playing tennis in one of his favorite courts. Well, that thing came through, and just that telegram came through on the side court. He had a couple of balls in his hand getting ready to serve, and a man came up to him and handed him the telegram. And Tsar Nicholas put his racket in his hand and reached over and took the telegram and took one look at it, and it said, the Navy has been sunk. I mean, 40 to 50 ships on the bottom, the whole Navy gone, the Imperial Navy. He took one look at that, handed it back, and he said, uh, 3015. And then put it down. He just didn't care. You know something? I talked to you about these things happening, and the Lord coming and leaving you left here. You know what the attitude of some is? 3015. Make the next buck, pick up the next TV show. That you better do. You better get in earnest about your soul. The Lord comes and you're left. You're going to have to work at it, work at it hard, and I'll work at it. I'll tell you something to get saved the tribulation. You've got to do more than I'm doing. You better have to let me out, do you? You'll have to go out it hard, and I'm going at it. I'll never make it. You better get in earnest. All right, last of all. The Lord comes, you're left in the rapture. 
You're going to have to die as a martyr. That's going to be hard for some of you. Some of you have never really thought about dying for Jesus Christ. Now, I don't misunderstand your bravery. Some of you thought about dying for your wife and dying for your children. I don't guess there's a man here that has a son that if push came to shove, he wouldn't die in his boy's place. But I'll tell you one thing. Some of you fellows have ever thought about dying for Jesus Christ and the tribulation. You're not even going to think about it. You're going to get a chance to perform. You're going to have to be a fanatic. You have to get the lunatic fringe. That's how they're scared in this day. These days, they say they're on the lunatic fringe. You know, back during the reigns under Charles, under the reign of Charles II, they took a Bible-believing woman and they got a hold of her and they said, we're after your husband. Where's he at? She said, he's hid. And they said, tell us where to find him. She said, I'll never tell you. They said, we'll torture you till you tell us where you hid him. And she said, well, you can torture me, but I'll never tell. And it began. And after about 30 minutes, she said, will you stop torturing me if I tell you where I've hit him? And they said, yes. And she said, I'll show you where I've hit him. She pointed her heart. She said, I've hit him right down there, and that's the only place you'll ever find him. Then they had to kill her. Kind of fanatic, wouldn't you say? You know something? The tribulation, that's how it's going to be. You're going to have to die a martyr for Jesus Christ. I have news here from Russia. Testimony of a young lady in escape line of a Finnish mission from Russia. My name is Elka. I am a Soviet citizen by profession a school teacher. My family are members of the Communist Party. I am not because I'm a Christian. I used to teach my pupils about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of this, I was fined a year's income. A year's income for teaching Christ in a school. In 1969, when I should have been set free, my sentence was prolonged for the crime of converting a fellow prisoner. Late one evening in 1969, I was taken with some other girls to a small ship. On landing, I was pushed into a car, and a man told me I am in Turkey, and that I have been brought there to be forced into prostitution. For refusing to cooperate, I was beaten many times. You said it'll never happen here. It will. It will. Our government right now is moving right in that direction, and they're more, are, they are more afraid of the friendship of this world than they are what God Almighty thinks of. Quote, a Ukrainian atheist magazine, number 671, tells about the internment of Brother Kachmar. One case among thousands, Brother Borislav is in an asylum, condemned to an asylum 25 years. He was healthy in mind once, but he's no more. Massive dose of aminism, Tryptazin and other powerful drugs are pumped into them. They're beaten up by the orderlies. The Christians are tied in damp sheets and cocooned as tightly as possible with straps of sheets placed almost touching one another. You won't get that from the summit conference. You won't get some politician go over there and tell you about this kind of stuff. Well, over there, there's your brothers and sisters in Christ over there right now. Some of them dying on the same asylums. You know what the government's going to do? Nothing. I tell you something else. They're not even going to mention it. And when it happens to you, nobody's going to mention you. The brethren Gulov, Gulov, Rogajin, Minyakov, and others are in prison for many years. They can't work to support their families. They work as slaves. Their families hunger. Their houses and furniture were confiscated. A Christian of the Soviet Union or Romania goes to a prayer meeting. For this, he can define his income for five months. His children will be hungry. Five months pay gone if they catch you at a prayer meeting in Russia. With a summit conference for disarmament. In Switzerland, the country so peaceful before, hand grenades were stolen from military ammunition depots. The National Zeitung, March 27th, the Republicaner of March 10th, and Berliner Tagblatt of March 13th, warned against the communist centers established in Switzerland, mostly by Italian and Spanish immigrants. That's strange, ain't it? There exist groups which mysteriously provide themselves with arms, so forth and so on. Now, I don't know when it's coming or how it's going to come, and I hope the Lord doesn't tarry. As far as I'm concerned, I, I just soon he'd come in the next three seconds. Uh, the quicker the better. But I'll tell you one thing. If he comes in the next three seconds, the four seconds, some of you folks are left. What you going to do? you going to die in your sins and burn in hell like a torch, or you're going to get on fire for God and be a fanatic for Jesus Christ and lay down your life for him? And as I said before, I don't think you have it in you. And you've been warned. I was warned. I took the warning. You know what we're like? We're like two men that come to a sign that says, Bridge washed out. Don't go any further. See? Now, I'm curious. See? I never lost my curiosity. That's one thing of the 
from being a child. I never grew up out of it. I usually go down and see if it's washed out. You know, I'm trying to figure a way to get across, like some of you. But I'll tell you, brother, when I see a sign in this book that says there's no way to get across, the bridge is washed out, and you better get saved now, I take it now. My curiosity doesn't prompt me to go ahead until the rapture and then see if I can make it. You know what you like? You like somebody come that sign and says, bridge washed out. Two farmers, two farmers hit one one that way one time. They're going fishing. And they came down this road, this old jalopy, and this other sign said, bridge washed out, proceed no further. And they took a look at it and said, well, I was there last week. So they went on down. And they drove down there about a mile and a half, and it was washed out. So they had to turn around and come all the way back. And when they came back, they saw on the back of that sign in great big letters, it said, I told you it was washed out. <laughs> With some guy, you know, they do, they check the thing out and come back and read it. But you know something? When the Lord comes and catches us out, that's what some of you are going to get. There are going to be some unsaved fellow that says, I told you he was coming. Did you know there are unsaved people in this town that know about the rapture? There are lost men and women in this town that know in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, they're going to leave. And the Lord is going to come and out they're going to go. All those unsaved fellows, when you get hollering and screaming about it, he's going to say, I told you so. I told you so. Maybe you'll tell him that. Maybe some of them you this morning tell these things too. Maybe the Lord will come tonight. Now they'll go and somebody said, my God, my God, what happened? What happened? What in the world happened? He said, I told you it's going to happen. The Lord is going to come. And he's coming and some of you are going to be left. I hope, I hope it isn't you. All right, let's stand for prayer. Father, I pray the Holy Spirit prepare this congregation. Not for judgment, but for the coming of Jesus Christ. We know it's going to happen many, many years for the judgment. Lord, help some soul here take these words to heart. May they never know what it's like to be left here in this drug mass population, this, the days of tribulation and darkness when the water has turned to blood, when the denizens of the world come out to roam this earth. Father, save every soul the sound of my voice right now, I pray, and save a soul that's the nearest hell right this minute. May they get the matter settled now. Never have to worry about it after you come, but join us taking the great airlift. Heads bowed and eyes closed a few minutes in prayer. How many of you people here this morning, you raise your hand and say, Preacher, I know I'm saved. The Lord Jesus were to come right this minute. I've got all the confidence of the world. If you were to come right this minute, I'd be caught up with him to glory. Would you raise your hand? That's your testimony. You know you're saved. You know if the Lord come, you'd, you'd go. All right, thank you. Put them down. Now let's pray just a few minutes. You people raise your hands. Pray with me and pray for me. As I close this service, you couldn't raise a hand. You're going to go through the worst time this world has ever known. And I'm not just talking to you. I'm telling you the truth. And I'll tell you something else. If you can read your newspaper and see between the lines, you ought to know what's coming. The devil ain't going to be satisfied until every Christian in the face of the earth is gone. And if they don't go up in the rapture, he wants to get rid of them for the rapture. Now, you know it's coming. How many people raise your hand and say, Preacher, if the Lord were to come right now, I don't believe I'd go up. I don't believe I've ever really been born again. Pray for me. Would you raise a hand? Would you raise a hand? We're in the building. Now, if you could raise a hand, the first proposition, there must be something wrong. Would you raise the hand? So I'm not ready. If the Lord were to come, I'd be left. And I tell you, if you're going to be left... It isn't going to be by grace you're saved through faith. All those passages you read in your Bible in Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 10, all those verses these preachers have been putting on you for a hundred years on works are going to come to pass. One second after we leave, it's going to be faith and works. Why don't you get saved now by grace? Raise the hand and say, Preacher, I'm not a child of God. I wouldn't go. I'd be left. Pray for me. Anywhere in the building. If not, we'll close. Here's the one anywhere. All right, we're going to close. We're going to close. And listen, if you're left, if you're left, don't you get upset. You're going to hell anyway. You better get upset about that right now. Don't you get upset after the Lord comes and leaves you here. 
You get upset right now. You got plenty to be upset about. And don't take any mark. And look out for the numbers. Brother Holloway dismisses in prayer. Nothing like a Bible to clear up the college education.